All right, so I might get started. Uh, Matt, Phil, if you guys are ready, um, we'll get started. I want to first of all start off by welcoming everyone today to today's Playbook to Increase Conversions Fireside Chat. Um, I'm really excited about being here. We've got a great lineup, uh, panelist uh, lineup for you. For those that haven't uh, seen me before, my name is Nicholas Kontopoulos, half Greek, half Aussie, and I've got the great privilege of leading Adobe DX commercial marketing uh, in Asia Pacific. And uh, as I said, we've got a, a great topic lined up. You know, we're going to take a, a look into this idea of what can be, how, how can we improve our conversions when it comes to all of the hard work we put in to driving people to our websites? What are the things we need to be thinking about in order to see those, uh, that hard work pay off and ultimately, you know, turn into obviously, hopefully delightful customer experiences, but also experiences that result in, you know, those customers going on and advocating on our behalf and also, you know, hopefully helping us, you know, turn a profit whilst doing that. So what I thought I'd do before we get into the conversation is just start the session by, you know, throwing, um, taking a look, oh, I'm having a slight technical issue. There we go. I would thought we'll start the session by hopefully, you know, throwing some mind grenades at you, get your brain juices fired up. And what we'll do is do that. We'll, we'll take a look at what's coming down the pike in terms of trends. You know, we've got these mega trends that are unfolding uh, in recent times, which are having a real impact on our businesses globally, regionally, and locally. And obviously e-commerce, everyone that's dialing in today would have most of you be familiar with this data point, but we, we do know that e-commerce is becoming increasingly a, a, an important part of the customer journey and part, uh, part of the customer engagement model. And obviously in recent times, we've seen e-commerce, uh, you know, spike significantly. In actual fact, uh, I saw a great data point last night showing from McKinsey showing that Basically, uh, e-commerce uh, growth has, in the last three months is equals that what it has occurred in the last 10 years. So we're seeing massive growth. We're also seeing, you know, the, you know, consumers, and we're all consumers. And I really want you guys to approach today's, uh, uh, you know, session also with this in mind. Each and every one of us is a consumer. We buy things. We, we connect with one another uh, digitally and physically. And, you know, on the digital front, we've seen, you know, massive penetration. And this is leading up to, um, you know, more recent times. This data point actually was from last year, from Statista, I think, from memory. Um, so we can only imagine that data points are only going to be significantly higher next year when they do another snapshot of this, you know, because of, you know, obviously the recent co impact COVID-19 has had on all of us in terms of forcing us to be more digitally engaged. Simon Kemp, who's a great thinker in this space and, you know, captures amazing data right across the globe, you know, recently presented on a webinar that we were involved with with him on, showing that people are spending more and more time with their devices, obviously, as a, as a direct result of, you know, the COVID's uh, his impact on all of us globally. Um, and ultimately, we're seeing, you know, as I said, you know, a huge shift in terms of consumer adoption of e-commerce. Um, in this region in particular, we see that APAC, you know, 76% of people have bought something in the last, you know, month or so. Uh, you know, through an e-commerce channel. So really becoming a critical component of our strategy. And as a result of, you know, the impact we've seen in recent times with, you know, the pandemic, what we're seeing is a mad rush for a lot of businesses to, you know, that hadn't maybe made those investments in e-commerce strategies, now making an investment in, in building an e-commerce presence out, you know, because uh, they're realizing just how critically important it's going to be. And the trick here is how do you do that without building a, a, a web experience or e-commerce experience that is, you know, very clone-like, yeah? And this is the big risk, you know, at the end of the day, our consumers have become way more sophisticated in how they, you know, view our brands and, and what they expect from us. So we need to be thinking about that uh, as part of our, any strategy that we, we embark on. We also need to be realizing that, you know, consumers are becoming increasingly demanding they really expect um, a more personal, individualized experience. So again, you know, we need to think about this, uh, you know, when we're architecting any uh, commerce strategy uh, as part of a broader omni-channel strategy or channelist customer strategy is another way of looking at it. You know, 91% of consumers say they are more likely to spend money with brands that make relevant uh, offers to them. So again, if we can use the data that our customers are sharing with us, and tailor that data in, in a way that connects with them. And ultimately, you know, that's everything from the content they see through to the offers we provide them. 
the, the reality is our, our consumers are more willing to share that data with us. So really, you know, when we, especially when we engage in customers at the early stages, all those first interactions we have with them are going to be quite critical as to whether they continue engaging with us or not. And we really do need to think about how do we move beyond this idea of personalization, which has now become pretty much table stakes to really, you know, individualizing that experience uh, that we deliver. So for me, you know, and I think, you know, anyone that knows me, this is a topic I'm very passionate about when it comes to customer experience. And I think, you know, ba delivering a, a basic solid customer experience is now table stakes. You know, the brands that win are the ones that are able to go that one step further in delivering delightful customer experiences. And again, today we're gonna to explore what are the, some of the ideas you need to be thinking about when embarking on this journey. And for that, I've got a fantastic lineup for you today. We've got Phil from WorldPay, uh, who's a general manager of WorldPay uh, Enterprise E-Commerce. We've got Britt, who is, comes from TransPerfect, another fantastic partner of uh, Adobe Magento Commerce, as is WorldPay. And obviously we've got Matt, the one and only Matt, who's gonna be also representing the Dot Digital team, who are another fantastic partner of ours. So Matt, if you don't mind, can we kick over to your uh, screen so that we can share this uh, lovely image of all of us. This is These are real photos. Hopefully our videos uh, match up with what, what is being shown here. So let's get the video feeds up and running. Hopefully everyone's faces are showing. Um, I'll make sure mine's showing because I just realized mine was not on. So um, excellent. So we've got Britt there. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hey, Britt, how are you? So maybe you've Good, just- thank a, you. how are you? Very good. What we'll do is a quick round of introductions, Matt, just a quick intro, add some color that I maybe missed out, you know, who you are and uh, and quickly who Dot Digital are. Absolutely. No, thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, so Dot Digital uh, as an organization, we are a all in one marketing automation platforms that merchants around Asia Pacific and the world use to alterate automate multi-channel campaigns to drive relevancy and that experience that you've just been talking about Nicholas whether it's email sms social live chat uh, we've got experts around the world that help merchants to use these channels for success excellent and Phil could you give us just a quick introduction yeah absolutely clearly I've aged since that photograph but that's okay um <laughs> No, look, yeah, uh, Phil, I, I'm the general manager for WorldPay. And uh, as you said, we look after all level of enterprise e-commerce businesses here. We, we cross Asia Pacific, we, we provide the end to end payment services. So literally, you know, offering all different types of payment methods, data to help clients to uh, you know, grow their experience and also grow their revenue as well. So delighted to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Excellent. And Britt. Yes, hi there. So I'm an account lead for retail in Australia and New Zealand over at TransPerfect. So we help companies localize their content and launch into non-English speaking markets at a reduced time and cost without compromising your brand message. Awesome. And we're not, I don't see you on the video. I don't know if that's just me, um, but this... uh, yeah, I think my, it's, it seems my webcam's Fine. having some. Not issues. a worry, not a worry. We will, let's get started. So Look, at Adobe, we have an amazing uh, lineup of customers that we get to work with, big and small, similar to all of you, no doubt. And, um, you know, we get, to, uh, you know, great insights in understanding, you know, what customers need to be doing when it comes to maximizing the conversion. How often it's, you know, I guess it's fair to say it's, it's hard to navigate around what solutions are needed and what systems are best put in place to, to be able to, you know, deliver uh, these amazing, delightful experiences that we're all striving to 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 deliver. Um, you know, in, in in this day and age, ensuring that you know the tools we use um, are optimized to to you know really going to be quite a critical part of any success. And understanding what your customers, you know, I, I touched on that with some of those data points, is also going to be increasingly important. You know, who are our customers? Why do they buy from us? What trends can we see in terms of the data that we're capturing? All these insights are gonna be really critical. And as I said, we've got, you know, obviously, you know, a great lineup of, of thinkers in this space. And I'm looking forward to you guys all sharing your insights with the audience uh, that are dialing in today from all over, actually. We've got people coming in from all over Asia. So I really wanna thank the audience for dialing in. So let's get started. I've got my first question here, um, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead out with uh, to, I think we're going to go out to, I'll go to Matt first on this one. Um, when it comes to acquisition and conversion, customer experience should be at the center of decision-making. 
how do you utilize your data to drive up site traffic? Or how can customers utilize data to drive up site traffic? Maybe Matt, if you take a first step at that. <clears throat> yeah, no, thanks, Nicholas. I think the, the key element of that question is customer experience. You mentioned it in your introduction slides. And what we have here is customer experience online is about having human conversations at scale. And if we look at that kind of shop front retail operation scenario, when you will first walk into a retail shop, if they're a new brand, they tell you a little bit about their brand, what it means to them. If they're an established brand, they tell you what's new, what's going on. And as we take those conversations into the online experience, we're having that same messaging. That's the same message we want to have. And there's a, there's a wonderful acronym, which is KFC. What do you want them to know? What do you want them to feel? And what do you want them to commit to do? And it's something that if we look at and take our kind of marketeer aim to tell them about my new product hat off and put our consumer hat on, what we need to look at is not the channel that we want to communicate on, the experience is the most important thing. What's the message? What do I want to get across? Uh, and then looking at how we can then digest that. And in doing that, or having that approach and having that mindset, you'll deliver that customer experience and you'll deliver that repeatability back into your shop, whether it's physical or online. That's great. I mean, localization is obviously a really key uh, point here to consider, Britt. So could you maybe share some of your thoughts on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. So from a digital perspective, content is the window into your brand. And in the technical age that we're living in, especially given the current climate, consumers are increasingly seeking and expecting a personalized and inclusive experience. So how do you deliver this from a language perspective across different markets and channels? <clears throat> well, considering that 75% of consumers would rather purchase products in their native language, you're already setting up your brand for success by simply localizing your content. Now, of course, I'm gonna highlight the importance of translation given I'm in the language game. However, stats from the same Harvard Business Review also show that over 50% of consumers are willing to spend more with you if you're willing to give them information in their own language. So meaning it's not just about the right channel, but the right messaging. So things to consider here are how are you monetizing your content? Do you have a customer centric approach? And how do you strengthen your brand on a global scale while still preserving the uniqueness of your brand? So if you're on a buying journey, for instance, and you see that leather jacket that you've been saving up for months for, you've made it all the way to the checkout and at the checkout page, it's in a language that you can't read. Would you be willing to put your credit card details in on a foreign web page? And if so, would you even know how to fill it out? Look, me personally, I'd leave the page and purchase a product that's similar from a website that I can actually read. And 84% of other consumers would agree with me on that. And I'm not here saying that everyone with an e-com store should localize all of their content for every market that they're in. However, if your data is demonstrating a high bounce rate for what should be a high performing e-com sto store, particularly at the checkout page, then this is a concept that should be considered. And it all drills down to, I guess, are you giving your e-com store the tools and the love that it needs to perform at its best? No, great points, Britt. And Phil, would you like to add in, any thoughts into the mix there? Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, I mean, I, I obviously come from a from the payments background, but I, I couldn't agree more with what Britt's just talked about there from the localization perspective. And we offer global services, but when we have global merchants talking about Asia and they come from, let's say, a US background where credit cards are, you know, the payment method of choice, to offer uh, credit cards across Asia Pacific, for example, you're gonna capture maybe 20% of the market in Indonesia, maybe 15% in other markets. So that, that sort of idea of a sort of one-stop shop and one, you know, one solution fits all across Asia doesn't exist. You know, the, the sheer fragmentation of the markets here and language absolutely is one piece around making a, uh, a consumer buy, but also they wanna see the local payment methods that are important to them. And in many different countries in Asia, there are literally different types of payment methods and we call them alternative payment methods, but I think even that term is probably an outdated term because they're no longer alternative. These are absolutely the payment methods that people require. So, you know, you need to look at each market individually from a payment perspective, if you want to convert at the highest levels and, and provide that customer experience. And you know, the piece I'd add to it as well is, and maybe we'll touch on this a little bit more and some of your stats talked about the move to digital and the move to mobile. I think, you know, you really need to understand um, that in this region specifically, there is a huge move to mobile. And, you know, if you're simply things like 
payment pages aren't mobile optimized, you're going to lose people on the way. So I think you really need to understand your audience to make sure that you can really convert at the highest levels. Yeah, I think, again, you, each of you brought some amazing points there. And, and, and this is the challenge. Um, you know, there is so many different elements we need to consider when it comes to customer experience and, you know, everything from, you know, the, the, the amazing content, the engaging content and how we localize that to your point, Britt, you know, in terms of the channels we use and, and how we engage those customers um, and ultimately payment, definitely. I mean, we're seeing, again, you need to have a really robust uh, payment, uh, you know, a pro or understanding of what is what each market is looking for. Like we're seeing in Southeast Asia still, you know, cash and delivery is still something that people want, um, you know, and that's still something, and, and that in particular with the uh, Gen Z. So again, it's a very complicated landscape you need to be considering. And that's why I think, what I'm really excited about having you guys here uh, today in this call is that you all represent core technologies that play a role in that custom experience. And I always say to people, there's no one technology that solves all of this topic, is there? I mean, it, it's going to require you having to think about it. Um, and again, if we go back to those, some of those data points that I led out with, and you guys have sort of touched uh, on this as well, you know, understanding your customer is really important. I think we'll all agree that, yeah, you know, and often sometimes we take it for granted. We think we know our customer and yet their behaviors may have changed or, um, so, you know, building that, you know, that user profile, Matt, maybe I'll come to you here. You know, if we think about data-driven practices as being essential in, you know, being able to create, you know, in creating your ideal customer profile, mm -hmm. Why is having a profile essential for retaining customers? Can you maybe share some thoughts on that? And I'd love then to get Phil and, and Brittany's views on that as well. But with you, we'll Mark, go with you. I'm going to steal the line from you, um, which is, you know, people buy experiences, not products. Um, mm -hmm. It's a fantastic phrase that Adobe have led with. And I look at that as the, the way in which we engage with a brand, whether it's someone we bought from you or someone we always buy from. You know, we've got more chances to kind of forgive someone if we bought from a few times and someone off. But actually, if we bought from a new brand um, for the first time and something goes wrong, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. It's actually an opportunity to, to really showcase who you are as a brand and what you mean. So I see negatives and experiences, even if they're positive or negative, as opportunities to succeed. So retaining customers comes then down to the data I have about someone. I know that you've bought from me. I know you've had a bad time. Have I dealt with it sufficiently? Well, don't ask yourself that, ask your customer. Ask them, hey, how would you rate my response one to 10? It's a simple survey, data comes back, and we can automate further journeys off the back of that. They could be browsing for the second time on your website and the automated campaign that goes to them because all of this is possible, very easy to do. Thank you very much. I know you didn't have a great time last time. We will make sure you have a great time this time. You know, it's simple. Uh, automation programs that as someone's going through that buying journey i go back to that storefront idea ditched in the sense that as you come into a shop and you remember the person's name and you've talked to them we can have that same experience through digital and understanding uh the customer segments or the customer data points that you have now is very important equally you've got the challenge that some say i've got too much data or i don't have enough data you have so much about your customer, you know what they're looking at on the site, you know what products they're buying, we know what frequency they're buying products, utilize all of this to then capture more data about them. So Indonesia, if we look at, you can get mobile and email address very, very easy. That's uh, something that Indonesian give away quite easily uh, as data. If we look out into the West, that's not the case. You know, I would never back in the UK have given my mobile number to anyone. But 83% of consumers are willing to give that information away if they deliver a better experience. Mm -hmm. So being honest about the data you collect, collect information that you can then use to drive a better conversation. And from that, you will retain customers as you start to talk to them on that human level. Some great points there, Britt. What would what would you uh, what advice would you share? Yeah, sure. So to build on from what you were saying there earlier, Nicholas and Phil, it is important to know your customer and to know your audience, and then to leverage from those data driven insights to inform your strategy. So meaning not all content performs the same, so you shouldn't invest the same. And so how to do this effectively? And a great example of how a client of ours did this, they're a luxury retailer based out of London, and they're wanting to launch their e-com site into China. And they had hundreds and thousands of SKUs, 
and to localize all of the content entirely with human linguists, it was going to cost the client around eight to nine million dollars USD in translation costs alone. So what we did with them was a content mapping exercise, determining which content was the highest performing to the lowest. So just as an example, we'll say, uh, your data demonstrates that consumers in China prefer to buy pink dresses over red dresses. So then we prioritize investment and optimization pending on the commercial importance of that content. So a hybrid approach, approach, a blend of human and machine translation. So human translation on the pink dresses, and machine translation on the red dresses throughout the entire e-com store. And the end result for the client, a huge 90% reduction in cost to launch, and they realized a 300% ROI year one. And I love this story because there's a real fear almost around machine translation. However, this does demonstrate that it is absolutely possible to launch your brand into a foreign market cost effectively and without compromising your brand message or user experience. So optimize and invest in that high performing content. No, great, great use case example there um, for sure. And again, you know, definitely um, a great example also thinking big, but starting small. So you don't go, you don't have to eat the elephant in one bite. You can go in and, and utilize available partnerships and technologies that enable you to get your foot in the door into a market and then use that insight you're getting to test and adapt in terms of how you you know what what where you maybe want to invest in you know human translation going forward versus uh, uh machine learning so that was a really cool great example phil what about yourself mate what are some of your thoughts on this topic around you know the ability to build you know clear profiles and and, and insights in terms of your customers how important do you see that as being uh for businesses as well yeah look absolutely i mean i think if you think of the the demographical sort of spread across this region and and the change and, and different people's payment habits you know if i think about my, my mother she'd rather pay with a coupon she's cut, cut out of a magazine for example i or some shekels potentially but you know people now really are looking at different payment methods for different age groups we talk about digital wallets being sort of you know huge growth across different parts and i think you know covid has had a huge impact on that really and people not wanting to touch cash but i think also when you look at specific and again this comes back to the personalization piece that matt mentioned and knowing who your customers are and you know if you know and i'll say gen z because i'm i'm english and, oh, sorry i'm gen z so i'll say gen z but i say gen z but you know you need to understand that they have different buying habits and actually if you look at the, the buy now pay later schemes which have come up really recently out of australia going global um, you know, you need to make sure that you're offering the right sort of payment methods. And they, they've really got hold in that Gen Z millennial type age group um, who you know, prefer the idea of being able to budget and sort of, you know, use those payment methods as, as a budgeting tool. So I think you need to know your demographics. Um, the other piece that you know, Matt touched on as well around personalization. You know, we did some research around the sort of the, the, the Gen Z sort of age group and they really do, they will spend more if you give them a personalized you know, um, product or services, whether that's subscription services, whatever it may be, if they feel they're getting value from it and it feels like it's more personalized to them and it's not this one sort of um, you know, standard product offering, they're likely to spend more. So I think absolutely critical, know your customers, use the data, use your, you know, use your partner's data as well to make sure that you can really target those, those, those groups. No, some fantastic insights there. And I think this, you know, what I, what the takeaways for me there is uh, obviously having that um, rich understanding who your customers are is yeah. without a doubt, uh, you know, a, a must have. Uh, but what's really important and what I'm hearing here is also how do you use that data? And I, I often talk about this notion of brand utility. You know, we need to look at how we capture data, use this data in a utility type fashion and really creating ultimately a service proposition with uh, for customers because i think at the end of the day you know we're willing to share data if we feel like we're getting something out of it yeah mm -hmm. if, we, if i'm not going to want to share data i don't feel like it's it's one 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 directional so i think this is the key takeaway and also the importance of um protecting that data i think you guys would all agree as well i think this is another thing that we're seeing across the region is a, a maturity in, in understanding the value of that data even though some markets are still maybe giving it away um, more freely, I think what we'll see is a maturity in them understanding the value of that data and also the expectation that data is being protected. I think you guys would agree that will be another key area of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you know what what we'll do now. Um, you know, I'd like to make a a, a slight pivot to sort of um, you know what well, we've touched on this idea of data you know we've spoken about the use of data in regards to retention of customers and i think that's a really key 
point. You know, we've often, as marketers, get focused on bringing net new names into 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 the company, but retaining our customers is, is ever increasingly important. But can can you build on this in regards to how you can use data to influence an omni-channel strategy? Um, you know, I'm not sure who would like to go first on that one. Uh, uh, again, anyone, maybe Britt, I'll come to you first on that one, or Matt, would you like to take a stab? Go ahead, Britt. Britt. So, in regards to Omni, um, and as a customer, you want to know what you can expect no matter where or how you're consuming your content. Um, an example of a company that does a great job of this is Starbucks. So Starbucks has a huge global presence and unlike other global fast food chains, their menu is exactly the same in every country, in every store using the exact same ingredients. So meaning the loyal Starbucks customer always knows that wherever they are in the world, they can get their favourite beverage or snack. And this has kept me personally as a returning customer to every Starbucks airport around the world simply because I know what I can expect and I know that it will taste the same wherever I am. And the same concept here applies to Omni. How are you talking to your customer and does this message vary depending on the platform or channel? And is your message being rendered accurately across those different channels? Um, in a time where enterprise content is both Omni and digital, a well thought out multilingual strategy is critical to the success of any global business. And at a time as well where your customer is moving from in-store to digital, the channel is how you talk to your customer and the brand voice is delivered through that content. So the key takeaways to consider here are how are you engaging with your customer? How does your customer transition from each platform in-store to physically checking out the product, online to browse all of the products and then mobile apps to purchase? And does your message support each step of the journey optimizing the entire customer experience? No, I, I like I like the example um, with Starbucks. I, I I remember my first business trip to Shanghai in 2007, and uh, I remember it was a hot summer's day. I'd been running around the city, and I, I was I was just wanting something familiar. I remember I was looking for something familiar. And it was a sea of signs, obviously in Chinese, and there was two logos that cut through the noise, and that was McDonald's and Starbucks. And I remember going into the Starbucks and feeling that sense of familiarity. And I think it's a key point that you made there, because again, you know, when you think about an omni-channel strategy, branding and, and, and omni-channel go together in terms of you know, having a great brand, but also being able to deliver a really great experience, whether it's in the physical or digital world is really becoming increasingly important. And the use of data, Matt, if I come to you, is, mm. is obviously becoming critical uh, component of that. We sort of touched on that earlier again, but maybe if you could expand your thoughts on what Brit Brittany uh, said there, that'd be great. I just seem to think that every time I see you, you've got a Starbucks in your hand or we've met in Starbucks. So, uh, you know, Nick, I think that, that story resonates with you, mate. Um, but it's consistency. That's the, the fundamental of um, uh, kind of what we're talking about here. It's consistency across the areas that your customer is. So if we think of the notion, if we think of omni-channel, omni is all things. That's what it actually, you know, that's the, the genesis of it. That's what it means. And we can't be all things to all person. Right, we can't. It's, it's a, as a brand, we we have our products and we have what we do well, and that's our differentiator. If we try to be all things, we'll be not, you know, nothing. So if we look at consistency, being consistent in what we do, being consistent in the channels that our customers want to talk to us on. So providing them with the opportunity, and where we use data to influence that is to simply test. We get clients that come to us and talk about the utilization of SMS. They want to use live chat on their website. We've just launched it with Magento as part of the core code. It's been a fantastic uplift uh, for those retail operations that needed that direct communication on their website. But if we look in certain markets, SMS doesn't actually work that well. Uh, if we look into markets around Southeast Asia, SMS is extremely expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. One country in particular is three times more expensive than the other to deploy a message. And that then can impact the bottom line of, you know, the, the effectiveness of a campaign. And equally, we've got the types of channels all have a time and a place. So social retargeting is great as the products follow you around, but what's that message? You know, you forgot this in your basket, or do you still want to buy that laptop, Matthew, that you keep looking at on Apple? Of course I do. I just don't want to spend that amount of money just yet. And so that consistency and non-intrusive, but keeps you kind of being reminded that that product is so important. And data allows us to test different channels, but also to ensure that 
we are measuring the success of the effort we're putting into that. So as we look at an omnichannel strategy, don't just put it in place and leave it. Keep going back to it and analyzing, has it had a marginal increase putting an additional channel, putting additional step, or putting additional content in place, and having the people that can help you understand that. Yeah, and I mean, Phil, you have you got a thought there? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, mean, I, I think, you know, again, through the payments lens, um, omnichannel is becoming, you know, increasingly important in many of the markets in the region here. And to, to everyone's point, just being recognized across different channels is critical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if someone might be buying on a website and taking that back in store, vice versa, I think even if you go into some stores now, um, you know, that people often talk about retail is dying, but I think actually retail is in the high street is just evolving into something different. And I think you can go to certain shops in certain countries now where it actually feels like you're buying online. You're just going in there to look at the product and check the sizes and check the materials because people still want that experience, right? So I think you know, from a payments perspective, it's critical that you recognize that person across the various different channels. You know, you'll hear about sort of tokenization as a way of, you know, tokenizing a customer or tokenizing their payment details so that it does make life easy for me should I cross the channels. Um, and I think that's just going to be an increasing thing as, as people now, again, coming out of COVID, or as we still say in this current situation, depending on the market you're in, it's even more important where people are spending more time online. But, you know, should the world suddenly change in a few weeks' time, then bang, they're going to be back out on the high streets, you know, with, with full spending power, as we've seen certainly in Singapore recently. So I think, yeah, just making sure you recognize that customer, making sure the customer feels special across both um, is absolutely critical. Yeah, and I think the point you made there really uh, is important. We want to track that movement, you know, positive not a creepy way um for a customer in terms of as they move between channels because omni channel for me um you know we've all been part of this conversation for some time i think it, in in some respects it can be a risk of looking at it too much through a technology uh, my lens um and i mm -hmm. often talk about this notion of channelless customer as being the strategy should be the umbrella strategy and the omni omni channel is definitely part of that but it is coming more at sort of you know, maybe through a more of a technology approach, because uh, that's where the conversation I've seen sort of, sort of, it's become really tech orientated. And I really want to challenge everyone that's listening today and sort of picking up on the thoughts you guys have shared is really coming at it from your end customer's uh, perspective. I know it sounds obvious, but I do see that mistake being still made is that we're not really thinking about the customer and how he or she transitions across all of these different touch points as you you said phil starting in a physical channel sometimes now that the, the, the walls are blurring there um you know in terms of whether it's a physical or digital experience you must be engaging in both so i think that's really important so really having this channelist mindset but thinking of a channel more as a, a window into your brands so would you guys agree that's really what we need to be thinking about is it's just a, it's one window one of many windows that they might be using to to get a uh, to look at your brands through. So I think it's important that we understand how we bring those together. So really great insights there, guys. Um, my apologies if you can hear some building. They've just decided to start building uh, in uh, next door. Haven't been building all week. They decided to start today. So awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the joys of working from home. But, uh, but yeah, look, you know, we've talked a lot about obviously sort of the importance of, um, you know, data and personalization and understanding our customers. and really, uh, you know, but also obviously technology does play a role in it's ultimately the technology you're gonna select and the partnerships that you select are gonna be really important. Um, so why is choosing the right platform system so important in terms of increasing conversion? Um, you know, because, you know, I'd love to get your guys thoughts. You know, we all represent different technology uh, solutions that are gonna play a key role in, in helping uh, deliver on a lot of what we've spoken about today. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on, why that is important maybe phil i'll come to you on this one mate yeah no absolutely and i you know i touched on it a moment ago about the current environment and the current situation that it you know we all expected this drive to digital to be happening right and i think you know we you know we produce something called the global payment report we talk about it quite a lot in terms of over the last few years of this drive towards e-commerce and mobile commerce and the current situation that we're all in at the moment have been for the last sort of four six months has just seen a rapid expansion to that so that move to digital just makes you think well hang on a second i also need to make sure i'm in with the right partners as well and i think mm. you know from our perspective from a you know with partners you know we often talk about having that single integration single set of reporting you know single access to a wide variety of data and i think you know we touched on this a bit earlier as well you know you need to make sure that you leverage 
partners data across all of your different um, touch points with customers and payment methods or whatever it may be because ultimately when you can bring all that data together in a single view um, that's only going to help you make more informed decisions and I just think you know there are many partners out there today you need to make sure that you're working with people who have the right experience you know, if you're you know, if you want to come into Asia you make sure you work with someone who's got deep experience in Asia um, touching all of the various different channels or customers that you are looking to get into so I think it's never been more critical to have the right partner because you know I, I've heard of many stories of customers who have or merchants who have chosen the wrong partners who ultimately then need to make a huge dramatic change within the next sort of 12 18 months and in a time when cost is even more critical than it's ever been um, and getting your getting it right the first time you need to make sure you're working with the right partners because you know you can't know everything across all of the ecosystem you can't you know you really do have to outsource parts of this and i think you know, bringing together the right partners can ultimately help you get to that position of increased conversion at a much lower cost as well no, great points. Um, Britt, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, we, we got yeah. so, so from a language standpoint, uh, your partner is literally your brand voice for your foreign markets. And it's important to ensure that your message isn't lost in translation. I'm sorry for the terrible pun. I actually had to say that. <laughs> Um, and, and we completely understand that no one wakes up in the morning and is super excited to manage a bunch of translation projects. And an element of this is because there can be a lot of frustrations behind managing tedious translation projects back and forth around quality, consistency and concerns about messaging. And it can take away from your day to day role. So you have all of this content. What to do with it? How do you manage it? And it can be very overwhelming, particularly if you're new to the localization game. And so technology is crucial to help with the managing and the centralization of all of that content. And if you have a partner that you're satisfied with that can handle all those um, components, then you can focus back on your performance and your presence in those markets. And the right partner will be able to outline how you can launch into new markets without compromising your brand messaging, without blowing your budget and reducing that time to market as well by automation, AI and the centralization as well. Um, and so your business partner should also understand your company objectives, should come to you with ideas on best practices and let you sit back and focus on the tasks that you were actually hired to do rather than managing all of that content, which can take all of your time. And Matt, Matt, how about your thoughts on this because i think again this you know if we think about the um the topic or this question in particular you know you're not just typically when you're embarking on a, on a commerce journey um mm. and looking at building a commerce strategy you are ultimately need to consider well, or you need to consider the ecosystem you 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 you're plugging into because ultimately mm. like i said earlier and i'll say it again there is no no such thing as one piece of technology that's going to solve an end-to-end -end customer journey. You're going to need to work with a, you know, a number of different solutions. You know, everything from you know content management to the commerce solution, automation, marketing automation, all the way through to payments, through to logistics. There's uh, translation. There's so many elements that have to come together. So, would you agree that that this is a one of the maybe one of the areas that often um, customers maybe miss and don't, don't think about when it comes to how they make the selection processes and when it comes to technology vendors and, and ultimately the partners they're working with. It's a really interesting point to kind of um, to round off there, Nick. So I think the the dream here is you know the best of breed. So best of breed technology, which gives me best of breed people that know that specific thing really well and can give me the best possible advice, the best possible uh, experience. And this could be, as you said, logistical, it could be marketing automation, it could be my e-commerce platform. How they all knit together is fundamentally the most important thing. And, you know, I look at, you know, we've got 700 customers together, ranging from, you know, smaller brands all the way up to the St. Paul Smiths and, you know, Haynes for a group, for example. And they all leverage all of the, the facets of how we as two organizations are tightly integrated from a product perspective, but tightly integrated from an organizational perspective as well. So we can provide that advice. And it's to, to Phil's point is having the right people that know the markets, that have the teams there, that have the local experiences to enable you to be successful so that they can challenge you. And I think when we look at technology, the additive is we buy either on price or we buy on 
what solves a problem now, not looking to how we're going to scale and how that's going to change in the future. Or if something comes out of nowhere, do we have the right business partner? We don't buy the technology just off the shelf to say, let's just plug this in. As you know, we plug in a television, for example. We're plugging in something that is in intrinsic to our success as a business. If you need to get to work, you need a mode of transport that's going to be reliable, successful, can weather the storms, and that is your e-commerce platform. And off the side of that, you've got other technologies that will enable that car to do better and to, to be better for you, uh, or that vehicle will be better for you as you kind of navigate through what essentially is your journey into business. E-commerce is fun. Uh, I'm in it because it's challenging. You know, there's a lot going on and things can just come out of nowhere. Um, the emergence of uh, the current situation means the technology like live chat have become fundamentally important as we shift retail staff operations to being online team. What used to be that kind of 80, 90% of the monetary value or the worth comes from retail, it's now shifted entirely online. So teams are having to upskill, teams are having to learn quickly, adapt because their customers are adapting just as quick as well. So when we buy technology, make sure it's knitted together nicely from a technology perspective, but talk to the people there, get to know these experts. Are they there to help you? Are they growth experts in how they can help you grow your business? Because not just in times like this, but whatever comes in the future, people are the most important thing. Well, I think it's some really great points you've all shared there. And I, I you know, for me, um, you know, I often talk about this idea of a customer experience ecosystem. Yeah, so it's, mm. we tend to think about customer experience in terms of our four walls of our company, um, and we really do need to think much more broadly than that. Ultimately, I mean, if I give you a simple example, you know, I can go to a website, make a purchase, um, and then those goods can be delivered to me. And uh, but if they're delivered late or damaged, I don't think of the logistics provider I, as in you know whoever that may be. Mm being the one that failed I, I remember the brand that i purchased from as being the the, the point of failure so understanding how you bring these different partners together and having and their understanding of one another is so crucial in my opinion when it comes to delivering a really great customer experience and also on the systems integrator side i think you guys would all agree here because obviously we're technology we represent fundamentally the technology piece of the pie here Selecting the right systems integrators, I also think is really important. I often see customers make mistakes here. Um, they might, you know, they'll select great technologies like ours, you know, in terms of being part of, you know, their strategy, but then stumble in not really making the right selection in terms of systems integrator. And I feel that that's a really important area of investment as well, making sure you're going with people that have got deep credentials and understanding of how to work with the technologies they're putting together. Would you guys agree with that as well as being an important part of the partnership mix? Absolutely. 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 Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's it's it's, it's all about yeah, partner. Yeah, the, the ecosystem word. I know we all use it a lot, but it really is. You do have to bring out everything together here, and you know the weakest link will be the part that will ultimately undo any form of great strategy, right? So you need to make sure your all of it is knitted together very well. And Matt, you said I just like to understand you. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna. I was going to jump in and say, and just like understanding your audience, your system integrator needs to understand your objectives too, and how does mm -hmm. how does everything piece together, and what's going to um, equip you to um, perform and succeed in your um, in your target markets as well. No, totally agree. And Matt, you said it earlier, and I think um, you know it is a journey. Yeah, this is not a destination. I mean, end of the day, every time we think we've got this buttoned up something changes, you know, the market changes, technology, but also behavior. This is the other thing, human behavior is constantly evolving and changing and technology is driving a lot of this. So all these different apps and technologies we're using are fundamentally changing the way we engage. I often use it in some of my keynotes, a video of um, a shot in New York at nighttime and you see this mass crowd of people looking at their screens of their phone and moving across one of the roads there and into Central Park. And it, it was um, Pokemon Go. It was these guys chasing avatars. It was when that first took off. And that still plays out here in Singapore. I mean, you go to some of the shopping malls here on a weekend and you see people chasing, you know, large groups of people. But what's interesting about that, and something for us to take note of, is you're seeing human behavioral changes occur on the fly there. And that opens up new possibilities for how you can engage with your customers, doesn't it, guys? I mean, this is this is something where I think, again, being keeping your finger on the pulse of 
what's happening in, in the market in terms of how technology is being consumed and utilized by consumers is going to be an early indicator of potentially what they're going to expect from you in terms of engagement model for you and also what you know an opportunity for you in terms of reimagining how you might engage would that resonate with you guys as well as as an I opportunity quite like it. I, the, yeah. this, um, I use this analogy we get asked all the time okay we're building a new e-commerce site which agency would you recommend and it's like uh where do i start picking an agent picking an si is like picking a life partner you know yeah. what role do you want to play in this relationship to your point, Nicholas, you know, as a marketeer, do you want to be the doer? Do you want to be knee deep into the, the infrastructure, the platform, actually building the content, building the, the, the kind of website and building those elements, the technical, or do you want to be the one out on the road or speaking to your customers and sitting in customer service for a day, learning about the challenges that they're facing to then feed that back to someone just as, you know, my roles, you know, I, I'm the cook and, you know, I've, my friends and partners that I've had will, are there to do, you know, have other roles and we play that together. So just as you would pick a life partner to, and you both split those roles and responsibilities, you need to do that with your SI and clearly define what those roles are. And, you know, if that changes over time, you talk about it. So if anyone ever asked me which agency um, or SI would I recommend to you, it's like meet them all and pick the one that you could go out for a beer with. It's as simple as that. I think that's a great point. And again, there's no silver bullet here and it is very much down to the all our companies' DNAs are different. So again, you, you need to really um, make that connection. Listen, look, I've got this construction's getting louder here. I'm hoping it's not being too noisy for everyone, but we're coming up on time anyway. Uh, so I'd like to you know thank everyone um, for today's session. You guys each brought some really great insights in there. And hopefully, um, like I said, you know the goal here was to throw some you know, mind grenades to get the audience, get their brain juices fired up and success for us will be them walking away with one or two ideas that they can start, um, you know, noodling on back in their office. Uh, it is a journey, as we've said, you know, so don't think this is something you can solve, uh, you know, in, in one foul swoop, but you've got, you know, four or five people here that you can connect with on LinkedIn now. I'm sure Phil, Matt um, uh, and Britt, and sorry, four of us, myself uh, more than happy to to connect with anyone on uh, online so feel free i'm one of the only contopolises in the uh, linkedin uh, rolodex so i don't think there's a too many in there but feel free to connect with me and the I guys google now. i'm gonna check yeah. <laughs> there ain't too many as uh, if i google contopolis there's a lot of uh, a lot of doctors sadly i didn't get the qualifications to to get to the level of uh, uh, education but yeah look really did enjoy this session you know thank you very much and for the audience that's dialed in you know really appreciate you guys dialing in and uh, wish you a wonderful morning afternoon or evening depending where you are at this point in time but thank you everyone ciao thank you very it was much great to chat Have a good one. thank you thanks all